Um, All right, so um, uh, Joachim sends his regards and uh, regrets that he cannot be here this morning. So he asked me to be here and I had to make a sacrifice. I had to get up at 5 a.m., drive through the dark from the beautiful mountains of Stad, where my husband is still waiting for me to return for our holidays. <laughs> but I think um, it's really an honor to be here because the, um, you know, the you know, dengue vaccines have um, hit the, the media in the past 12 months. and. Um, I hope I will do some justice in 20 minutes to the complexities of dengue vaccines. So, uh, Joachim uh, Hombach and myself, we had the privilege of uh, facilitating, coordinating the whole six month SAGE processes that led to the uh, revised um, recommendations. And if you want to read more about it, it was uh, published in the Lancet ID, and the uh, WHO position paper based on the SAGE deliberations was published on 7 September uh, this year. So, um, assuming, as virologists, that you all know about dengue, just a very brief um, summary. So, dengue has four antidemically distinct serotypes, each of which can, uh, can uh, cause a whole a range of, of uh, clinical manifestations of dengue. And it's more the sequence of dengue infections that, that um, um, contributes to the severity of disease. So, primary infection can be anything from asymptomatic to mild to moderate to severe, but it's really the second infection that is associated with a higher risk of more severe disease. And then from clinical perspective, cruel studies, we know that actually the third and the fourth infections are associated with milder disease again, which is also an important observation relevant to our discussions later. Uh, so dengue is a, is a disease of high morbidity with about 390 million infections per year of which about 50 to 100 million cases are clinically symptomatic. It's really the unpredictability and the cyclical nature of, of the disease that overwhelms already fragile uh, healthcare structures. Um, so it's a, it's a disease of high morbidity but actually low mortality. If you under very good case management you can bring down the case fatality rates to far below um, 1%. It really should be below 0.4%. So with that, um, so after decades now of research, we finally have three leading vaccine candidates. Um, the first of which was licensed in 2015, and the other two are now currently still in phase three trials. All three dengue uh, vaccine candidates are live attenuated vaccines. So what is the difference between the three vaccines? I hope there's a pointer. Um, is that a pointer? Yeah. So the difference is, is the backbone. Um, so the, for all vaccines, they're tetravalent and they use the pre-membrane and the, and the E uh, surface proteins um, in, in the vaccines. But for the, for the Sanofi Pasteur vaccine, the backbone is a yellow fever backbone. For the um, yellow fever backbone, for the um, for the Takeda vaccine, uh, they have the dengue serotype two as the backbone for all four serotypes, and for the NIH uh, vaccine candidate, uh, they use of the of the four serotypes, they use three full genomic serotypes, and only serotype two has a backbone, and that backbone is serotype is dengue serotype four. So. Um, as said, um, of those, only one has now been licensed, and that's the, uh, the CID TDV by Sarofi Pasteur, and I will now focus on this vaccine. So why, why really has dengue vaccine development been so difficult? I mean, there are many challenges, but really the challenge is the interaction between the four serotypes. So after infection with one serotype, you have lifelong solid immunity against that serotype, and that's called homotopic immunity. However, there's also heterotopic and even multitopic immunity. Heterotopic immunity refers to the notion that after an infection with one serotype, you also elicit antibodies that are cross-reactive and transiently cross-protective against the other serotypes. For, so for some time, um, so you will have all three or four serotypes um, elicited and you're protected against reinfection 
for, for, uh, within the first six months, some say even up to 12 to 18 months. So here it's protective, but at, as time evolves, those uh, cross-reactive heterotypic antibodies uh, wane. As they wane, your protection now uh, changes into something else, and now it changes into immune enhancement. So it really depends both on the timing and the level of antibodies, whether your antibodies are going to be protective or actually disease enhancing. And if you've understood this observation, you will also understand the results that I am about to, to show you to you with regard to the dengue vaccine. But also important for this observation is this, when you do a PRNT, plaque reduction um, visualization assay, at this time, you will actually measure tri or tetravalent response. And the PRNT cannot differentiate between a homotypic and heterotypic antibodies. So if you understand this, you understand what happens here, because actually when the, dang when the phase two trials came out, and I was even part of that, the, uh, you actually see a, a relatively tetravalent balance in your response to all four serotypes. This at a time was so encouraging to the company that they, that they built their manufacturing capacities before they had a phase three trial results. Understanding how the PRNT works and the natural history of it, you, uh, it does not come as too much of a surprise, although it was a surprise, that this relative balanced immunogenicity did not translate into clinical protect protectivity. In fact, vaccine performance was very uh, varied uh, upon, uh, depending on various uh, factors. So it, it, it varied by serotype, it was better for three and four. It varied by serostatus, it was better for seropositivity. It, uh, it was also, it, it, it protected more against more severe disease, and it was also uh, more efficacious in older age. These were the results that were available after the, f after the two years um, efficacy, efficacy trials, which, which lasted 12 months after the, the third dose. Then also, as we know, in, the, in, in year three, we then saw increased um, severe disease in those aged below uh, nine years of age. So with this very, so SAGE, our WHO is called upon um, to provide recommendations after a vaccine has been licensed. So this vaccine was licensed, SAGE was called upon, and with this very, very um, complex vaccine performance, this is what they came up with in, in 2016. First of all, because of the higher risk of, of, of the adverse events seen in those in the younger age. It was licensed only for the age nine and above. And with the whole picture together, they decided that this vaccine should only be given in a very restrictive, so restrictive recommendation and a very limited use. And that limited use was for very high burden disease countries with a, as defined uh, by a cell prevalence of 70% and above. And uh, the, uh, the rationale at the time was that this, this would um, have both a public health benefit, but also limit uh, any potential safety concerns. But as you know, um, uh, at the time also uh, WHO then, uh, then requested Sanofi Pasteur to come up with better data stratified by Sarah's status. And indeed Sanofi Pasteur did uh, further studies and then the press release came on the 29th of November 2017. It's a day I will always remember because then I started working 7:24 at WHO to really respond to this crisis. As you know, when the press release came out, which said that individuals who have not been previously infected by dengue virus, which means they are seronegative, vaccination should not be recommended because more severe uh, dengue was observed in those who were seronegative. Now, you must also know that there were only two countries at the time that had introduced a dengue vaccine, and that was the Philippines and, and Brazil. In the Philippines, there was a, uh, was a program, a public program involving more than 800,000 people, and in Brazil, about 300,000. So you can imagine, this press release um, um, triggered a lot of uh, responses. There was a massive outcry in the Philippines. Mothers went to the street. Uh, they called, uh, mothers came together to sue the company. They called it genocide. Uh, the whole public was in uproar. 
uh, within the Philippines, but also beyond the Philippines. Unfortunately, the whole vaccine scare came into, uh, the politics came into play in this whole dengue vaccine scare because at the time, the new uh, uh, President Duterte accused the previous uh, um, President Aquino for using a dengue vaccine uh, for its advantage for, its, for the elections at the time. The Minister of Health lost her job. A whole cabinet lost uh, their uh, jobs, if not their heads. And in fact, even the principal investigators were put under criminal charges. This was a major, major outcry. So that parents of vaccine victims seek justice. In fact, it went beyond. So, so myths and misconceptions and lies came then about. So because of the neurotropic, because of the yellow fever backbone, which is known to have occasionally a neurotropic side effect, anything from uh, from, from, from lower uh, grades at school to insomnia, anything was now blamed on dengvexia. So it had a, a lot of what they call collateral damage with loss of vaccine confidence and unfortunately measles, co measles vaccine coverage plummeted from 80% to 20% and now there are major measles outbreak in that country. But also, uh, this also jeopardized um, a very um, high quality um, uh, um, vaccine adverse assessment uh, in, in that situation. So let's go now back to the facts. So how did Sanofi Pasteur determine serostatus dependent deformance? They could not do it a priori because only 13% of trial participants at beginning had blood samples taken. So we could not stratify by serostatus. So to do this now, what they did was in month 13, that means after three vaccine doses, blood samples were taken from all trial participants. And they employed a newly developed NS1-based uh, antibody assay to differentiate between the NS1 of the dengue of natural infection versus the, the NS1 of the yellow fever, which was the backbone of the dengue vaccia. And it had lots of miscla uh, misclassifications that inherent to this problem. But so what they did was then retrospectively infer who could have been a, uh, the serostatus at baseline. All right, so the, the vaccine trial is again, or the efficacy trial were, were the three doses. And after the 25 months, they, they changed to a passive hospital-based uh, hospital surveillance status where they only captured severe dengue and, uh, and hospitalized dengue. So now let's look at these results of serostatus dependent stratification. So the vaccine efficacy, remember there was only, those results are only for the first 20, for the first two years of the trial, showed that in seropositives, the efficacy is about 72% in seronegatives non-existent. Right, it, it crosses the zero, uh, the one. The relative, and so now, now let's look at the longer term observation time, which is the 66 months after the first dose. So here we only have data for hospitalized and severe dengue. And if you look at this, the relative risk of, of a severe biologically confirmed dengue in seropositive is 0 0.28. So that translates into an efficacy of 72%. So protective against severe disease in seropositives. But as you can see, in seronegatives, the relative risk was now three. So three times higher risk of having a severe dengue if you were seronegative vaccinated compared to a seronegative unvaccinated person. And this relative risk was only seen from month 30 onward of the trial consistent with what I showed to you in the beginning, that initially your antibodies, your cross-reactive, can be protective, but then they become disease enhancement, uh, enhancing after about 24 months. I like this figure best because it really shows to you what, what's happening here. First of all, may I draw your attention to the red line. Uh, so the red continuous line are the seropositive controls, so unvaccinated, versus the seronegative controls unvaccinated. This is the best natural experiment that underlines again that prior exposure to dengue increases your risk 
of severe dengue. So this is the red line has high risk of severe de dengue compared to the blue line of unvaccinated CR negative. Now let's look at the effect of dengue vaccine. Let's look at the seropositives first. So the vaccinated seropositives, unvaccinated, sorry, here the placebo versus the vaccinated seropositives here, you can clearly see there's a benefit for the seropositives. Clear cut. But the ser negatives, so these are the ser negatives where we're unvaccinated, and here the dotted line are the vaccinated. You can see that initially they're a little bit protected, but then they cross the line, and now there's an increased risk. So they're worse off than if they were not vaccinated. So how do we explain these observations? Um, so first of all, if you look at viremia induced by, by, by CYD uh, TDV, you can see that viremia is actually only induced by dengue zero type four. Secondly, you could also now, uh, there, there, now there are some depletion methods where you can actually differentiate in the PRNT whether it is a cross-reactive, a stereotype-specific um, antibodies or cross-reactive heterotypic antibodies. And as you can see from here, for the serotype 2 and 1, most of the PRNT were due to cross-reactive, not serotype-specific antibodies. Highlighting, again, what I explained in the very beginning, what we're seeing here was just cross-reactive. Basically, this vaccine almost acts like a monovalent, but I'm, I'm not calling it monovalent, like an immune-dominant serotype 4 vaccine. So the expla explanatory hypothesis then is that the vaccine uh, serves or acts like a silent infection. May I remind you, in the unvaccinated population, a secondary infection has a higher risk of severe disease. So what happens now in a vaccinated seronegative person who never had a vac nev never had natural infection now has a silent vaccine-induced infection and now ex exposed to its first <coughs> natural infection which then acts as a secondary like infection so now this person although it's its primary infection actually it, it acts like a secondary like infection with more severe disease outcomes in a, in a seropositive person though someone who had uh, one primary infection before the um, the vaccine now acts like a secondary like infection but it's silent and basically moves the primary infection the third and fourth. And if you remember, the third and fourth infections are milder infections. So this is the, our explanation for, for how CYD um, TDV performs. So it's a cell status dependent performance. It's efficacious and safe in seropositive people, but increases the risk of severe dengue in seronegative persons. So now this comes back to SAGE in 2018. How would you react? What would your recommendations be? So we had a several months process of going through all the data. And as you know, WHO's perspective is a public health perspective. And from a public health point of view, this vaccine still has a major public health benefit. So if we look at a 70% seroprevalence rate, which was the 2016 recommendation, uh, the impact over over 1 million vaccinated people over 10 years would be um, to prevent more than 5,000 cases. But when you prevent 5,000 cases, you will induce 500 cases in seronegatives. But your overall net benefit is positive. You have prevented 5,000 cases. If you go higher, of course, in seroprevalence, then you will even benefit more. If you go lower, then you will induce more harm than benefit. So here we had a dilemma. So we have here a vaccine. If you now look at the 70% seroprevalence that we have, for every one excess case that you now induce in a seronegative, it's offset by having avoided or prevented seven cases, uh, hospitalized cases in the vaccinated seropositives. Or if you look at an 85% dengue seroprevalence background, for every one excess case, that you have induced in a seronegative, you've prevented 18 hospitalized cases and seropositives. 
So there's a beautiful um, perspective written in the New England Journal uh, that I would like to recommend to, to you to read. But we, we as a WHO really had to go through a systematic approach how best to use this vaccine. And so we distanced ourselves from the Philippines outcry and had a very systematic approach where we went through all the scenarios from liberal use of this vaccine to all the nuances down to no use of the vaccine. And so then we discussed all this and then we came to the conclusion that we would neither use it liberally nor can we say that we should not use this vaccine because of the document benefits and the seropositives. And we came down to an evaluation of two strategies. One is the population seroprevalence strategy like the one before with the 70%, but we went up to 80%. Or using a pre-vaccination individual screening where you screen people for their sero status prior to vaccination. And so by looking, uh, by weighing up these two options, we looked at a number of dimensions, population benefit versus individual risk. Had, we had an ethicist and philosopher to come to help us think through the ethical considerations, risk perceptions and communication. How do you communicate this to the public having learned from the Philippines crisis? Um, what is feasible in terms of screening tests in individuals versus population-based screening tests, which we call zero surveys. So all the problematic issues, cost issues, and vaccine coverage estimates. Where would we achieve the biggest public health impact? We used all these and then went systematically through them and we put up a table that's all published. I will only, have only chosen a few aspects of it because of time. But basically, the benefits and harm of a population status criteria is the benefit clearly is shown, it's substantial population benefit. But the harm is you have an identifiable subset of a population that you now put at risk. So if you use 80% as self prevalence, you will put 20% of the population at risk. In a pre-vaccination screening strategy, you maximize the benefit seen in serum positives while avoiding harm in correctly identified serum negatives. But also with this strategy, there's a harm because we will never, have, anyone who knows flavor virus diagnostic knows, we will never have a perfect maybe um, a dengue diagnostic to 100, with 100% specificity uh, rule out. So some seronegatives will still be put at risk because they will inadvertently be vaccinated because of a false positive test result, right? So what's the risk? Um, here we have 20% risk. Here we have the risk of a false positive result where we then inadvertently vaccinate a true seronegative. But in the setting of 80% uh, cell prevalence and a 98% specificity, this would translate only in 0.4% of the population being wrongly vaccinated. In contrast to 20% in the cell prevalence based uh, criteria. We believe that there's more loss in vaccine confidence as we learned from the, from the Philippines uh, because individuals will not know whether I belong to the 80% or to the 20%. Um, so we, we believe that the communication issues are difficult for both, but even more difficult for the seroprevalence criteria um, um, strategy. So we went through all the issues, programmatic, etc., and then we came to the final conclusion, um, and then we opted for the pre-vaccination screening strategy whereby for countries considering a dengue vaccine as part of their control program, a pre-vaccination screening strategy is the recommended strategy in which only dengue seropositive persons are vaccinated. So this in itself we, uh, is also difficult, um, but this is our final conclusion. So what about travelers, which may also be of, of your interest? Remembering that for travelers, most of the travelers are seronegative. So this vaccine does not work for the vast majority of travelers. But there is a small pro proportion of travelers that are repeat travelers, expats, business, missionaries, development workers, etc., who may be seropositive and who may benefit from this vaccine. And remember that even after a single dose of a vaccine, for the first six months, you have a good efficacy. We just don't have data for a single dose for long-term efficacy. But we do have sufficient data 
that, that, the, that the efficacy between the first and second and second and third were as high as after the completion of all three doses. So currently, um, although the, the, the dengue vaccine, the, uh, dengue vaccine is not, is, has not been licensed in any of the dengue endem in any of the non-dengue endemic countries, except for one country, and that's Australia. Australia actually has licensed this vaccine. Coming to an end, what then is the hope for the second generation dengue vaccines? They are both still in clinical trials. The NIH vaccine has a problem that there's a single country trial and currently they don't have much dengue. So, so their observation time is going to be extended, but for the, um, for the Takeda vaccine, we'll have a first readout by 2019. So to remind you, is there, is there going to be a class effect? Will we see the same? I think it's too premature to speculate, but you have to, remem to remember the differences between those vaccines again. Dengue vaccine is three doses versus two versus one. Uh, and the age is probably, we will have to wait. But I think what's very, very important in terms of natural proteins of the dengue vaccine, the NIH vaccine has 32 versus 18 for Takeda versus only eight for the Sanofi Pasteur product. So that we will probably expect some differences in, in, in efficacy for those second generation dengue vaccines. Thank you for your attention.